Transplant Games. And I'm representing World Transplant Games Federation. Uh, and I'm sitting in Sweden. So here we have after lunch right now. So uh, it doesn't matter where you are or uh, at, in what time zone. So, but anyway, you are very warm, warmly welcome to the World Transplant Games Federation's Research Initiative webinar. And today we will have Abby Gregg. She's a PhD student from the Department of Geography at the University of Cambridge presenting a paper. And uh, she will present herself a little bit more in depth. But uh, the title of her presentation today is This Family and the Games Are My World, Conceptualizing the British and European Transplant Games as Therapeutic Landscapes. So uh, I'm uh, welcome everyone and uh, the floor is yours, Abby. Perfect, thank you. I'll just share my screen. Um, okay, hopefully everyone can see that. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so I want to start by um, thanking Anders um, and the Federation for inviting me to speak today. Um, as Anders said, um, my name is Abby. I'm a PhD student in the Department of Geography at the University of Cambridge. So I'm not a medical expert. I'm not a kind of sports or exercise expert at all. Um, I'm a social scientist and very broadly, I'm interested in questions relating to health and well-being. And for my uh, PhD work, which I'm currently in my final year of, um, I'm focusing specifically on transplant recipients. So for most of today's presentation, I'm going to focus on um, this paper that um, I recently had published, which is on the British and European transplant games. Um, but I thought I would start by kind of giving a bit of a broader overview um, of my work and um, perhaps most importantly, why as a geographer, I'm sitting here um, talking to you all about organ transplantation. Um, if the slides will work. Okay, yes, so the question that I get most asked uh, when I tell people about my work is, why is that geography? Why is a geographer looking at organ transplantation? Um, or some variation of that question, um, which is a very valid question, um, considering that at school, at least in the UK, we get taught that geography is about kind of rocks and rivers, glaciers, population pyramids, um, so that kind of approach to geography um, implies that geography is about certain topics, um, whereas in reality, I would say that geography as a discipline is not about what you study, but how you study it. So really, you can take any topic, any issue, and look at it through a geographical lens or a geographical mode of analysis. And so I've done that with organ transplantation. And I always say to people, as geographers, we are interested in questions of space, place, time, and scale. So looking at different environments and landscapes, looking at particular locations and places, how things change across time, how things operate at different scales, these sorts of issues. And if you are approaching your research kind of through that analytical lens of space, place, time, scale, using at least kind of one of those modes, then you are approaching your research in a geographical way. So if we kind of take that as the background, I look at organ transplantation through this kind of analytical toolbox, if you like. Um, but kind of more broadly, um, this kind of approach has led to the development of the subdisciplines of medical and health geography, which I don't seem to be able to share my slides very easily. Oh. Okay, there we go. So technically there are two separate subdisciplines, but I'm just gonna kind of lump them together and talk about them as one today. But it's basically using this geographical toolbox, this analytical toolbox to approach questions relating to health, medicine and well-being. So I've just put some examples up on the slide here. Um, and you can see there's kind of a mixture of qualitative and quantitative methods um, of analysis. Um, some are kind of more obviously geographical, for example, disease mapping and modeling, disease ecology, um, environmental epidemiology. But all of them in some way are concerned with 
health, well-being, disease across space, place, time and scale. And for me in particular, I am interested in these bottom two. Um, so spaces and places concerned with medicine, health, care and well-being and everyday experiences of health and well-being. So I hope that kind of gives kind of bit more context and makes a bit of sense as to why as a geographer uh, with no medical knowledge at all, I am kind of doing research on organ transplantation. And so it's from this background and this wider interest that I have developed my PhD work. So I'm not going to go into depth on my kind of overall work, um, but just to kind of help situate what I'm doing. Um, my research is um, looking at exploring the embodied lived experience of receiving a deceased donor kidney, heart or liver transplant as told by recipients. So I've so far done 44 semi-structured interviews, and that's kind of the breakdown of each organ type there. Um, and really as a side project, I thought, oh, it would be interesting to go along to the games. Um, and so I decided to go to um, the British Transplant Games and the European Transplant and Dialysis Games. They were just the easiest ones for me to get to, really. So I went to both of them. Um, there we go. Um, in 2022. So the Leeds Games and the Oxford Games. And when I attended the games, I really didn't know what to expect. Um, I'd only recently heard about the games. I didn't know much about it, to be honest. Um, and so I kind of went in with the view that I will talk to whoever is willing to talk to me. I didn't go in with a specific aim or something that I was looking to explore or investigate. I just kind of went and thought, we'll see what comes from this. And hopefully that will be something interesting. Um, So my data collection. So when I was at the two games, I did 34 informal interviews. So what I mean by that is they were more kind of conversation style. Everyone that I spoke to obviously knew I was a researcher and this was for research and I had explained that, but it wasn't like we did a sit down formal interview where I recorded the conversation. Um, it was really just kind of chatting to people at the side of events and um, in the kind of participant viewing um, areas or at social events, that kind of thing. And as I said, chatting to anyone and everyone who was willing to talk to me. So while my PhD work focuses on deceased donation in heart, liver and kidney participants, uh, recipients, sorry. This work just kind of focused on anyone. So I also spoke with kind of friends and family members who were there, um, live donation, deceased donation, any kind of transplant. So this work isn't narrowed down in the way the rest of my work is. And when I was there and I kind of you know, I would talk to people and then I would kind of scribble some notes down at the time as we were chatting. And then afterwards I would go away and I would write up more kind of detailed notes about what we had said during our conversation. I started to kind of look at what was emerging. As I said, didn't go in with an aim, didn't know what I was going to be looking at. But from my kind of background and interest in health geography, I started to think about the games as what in geography we would call a therapeutic landscape. So the term therapeutic landscape um, was coined by the geographer Wilbert Gessler, and um, it was used to explore why certain places or situations are perceived to be therapeutic. So in other words, a therapeutic landscape is looking at a kind of health promoting space, place, environment, or somewhere where health and well-being can improve and is kind of placed central in that in particular environment. So since it was first kind of conceptualized in the 90s or the early 90s, um, a huge body of work within geography has emerged looking at therapeutic landscapes, looking at a variety of spaces and places and how they help promote health and well-being. So, for example, there has been work looking at green spaces. So these are your kind of like leafy landscapes, if you like, um, parks, gardens, woodland areas. You have blue spaces, so um, watery landscapes, the sea, um, outdoor swimming, um, river walkways, that kind of thing. Um, people have also looked at more everyday spaces, such as the home. So how can the home contribute to one's health and well-being? Coffee shops, community centres, support centres. 
Um, and then, of course, your kind of more traditional kind of uh, therapeutic or medical spaces, the hospital, um, hospices. Um, there's been quite a lot of work on things like supported housing um, and psychiatric clinics as well. But obviously, all of this work is very kind of place dependent. This particular location is therapeutic in some way. And that doesn't necessarily align with the games. Obviously, the games move location every year, and it's not that particular space that makes the games therapeutic. But in geography, there has been a more recent shift towards understanding spaces as relational. So rather than a particular place being innately therapeutic in some way, understanding that particular environment can be therapeutic because of the social interactions that happen there, because of the relationships that are formed in that particular space at that particular time. Um, and following this, I thought that we could start to understand the games as a therapeutic landscape. And so within the paper, I talk about the games and I have three arguments, three different kind of reasons why I think that the games um, are a therapeutic landscape. And I'm going to go into a bit more detail in all of them now. Um, but just to kind of preface before I put the slides up, I have um, some quotes from participants that I spoke to. Um, but all of the names that are used are um, pseudonyms. So uh, to keep everything anonymous and I've not written down what kind of transplant they had, there's a rough age uh, range put in, but just to kind of give you an idea of um, the types of people I was speaking to. So um, no one should be able to identify anyone from any of the work. Okay, so the first argument that I make is that the games can be understood as a landscape of belonging or a space of understanding, a space of family. So the first question that I always ask people when I started speaking with them is, why do you attend the games? Or why did you decide to come to the games? And more often than not, the answer always revolved around something to do with wanting to meet people who had gone through the same thing as them, wanting to be around people who understood them, uh, wanting to feel like they fitted in, wanted to feel like they belonged, something to do with kind of understanding and belonging in some way. So, for example, up on the slides here, we can see Arthur, Rachel and Sarah. They all talk about, um, you know, being at the games and having people who understand what you have gone through. And and Sarah talks about kind of being in it together. Um, so people talked about, for example, being able to discuss issues with their peers at the games that they felt they couldn't do so with people from outside of the transplant community. So for example, medication or symptoms, side effects, how they felt about their transplant, these sorts of things. And I actually had a few people say to me, I would really like to talk to my partner, for example, about this, but they don't understand. Whereas here at the games, people do understand what I've gone through and I feel like I can have that kind of open conversation with them. Um, I actually had a few people go into specific detail on symptoms that they had and how worried they were when they started to develop. Um, so one gentleman spoke about shaking hands after um, being on his immunosuppressants um, and someone else spoke about memory loss. And for both of these participants, they told me how when they came to the games, they spoke to people on their team and said, I'm really worried about this or this doesn't seem right. And the people that they were speaking to went, oh, we have that too. I've experienced that too. And that kind of reassurance that they weren't the only one going through this. Other people have also kind of, you know, they know what they're talking about. They understand. And people, someone actually kind of said to me, it kind of helps you feel more normal. It kind of helps you kind of feel like you fit in a bit more. Um, so, you know, of course, those symptoms didn't necessarily go away in talking to people about them but how you felt about the symptom were, was eased and kind of you felt that reassurance by knowing that you weren't the only one and that other people understood you. And it's this kind of like idea of like, we're all in the same boat, we all understand. And that can be highly therapeutic for people, especially if in their personal life, they don't know anyone who has had a transplant. Um, so following that, it is unsurprising that people form strong friendships, strong bonds with the people that they meet at the games. And one of the most common phrases that people used uh, with me was transplant family or some variation, you know, 
uh, one big family, my transplant family, these are my family. The word family came up uh, so often um, during my conversations at both the British and the European Games. And you can see here that Amy kind of specifically says, these people are not my friends, they are my family. The relationships that she's forming with people, they're on that kind of higher level than just kind of being someone that you're friendly with. So um, people talked about the kind of importance of having that community that you felt were there for you, that understood you. And people also spoke about how it wasn't just at the game specifically where they felt that way, but it was, you know, ongoing after the games had ended group chats people talked about doing zoom calls um in the lockdown period and kind of motivating one another that kind of thing so this kind of notion of that kind of understanding it, it's not just about the games it extends far beyond that so to kind of summarize this argument um we can kind of look at the games as this space of belonging this kind of space that evokes a notion of like I belong here this is my family this is my space um, and it provides participants with an important mental health resource that they may not have received had they not attended the games. Okay my next argument that I talk about in the paper is that the games are a therapeutic landscape of hope um, and this is something that uh, Gareth also talks about in his research, which was very helpful and reassuring for me to read um, when I was writing this paper. Um, so kind of in line with that, a number of my participants also spoke to me about how encouraging it is to go to the games and see other people um, who, you know, they're further out in their transplant than they are. So if someone has only had their transplant for two years, yet they just watch someone win a gold medal who is 20 years further out of their transplant, then that's reassuring, that's encouraging. You know, you think I could also do that. I can also lead that fit, active, healthy lifestyle 20 years down the line. Um, you know, if you think about it at the games, you are seeing people around you, they're running, they're swimming, they're cycling, X, Y, Z. You're kind of encountering this kind of living proof in transplantation and not just that you can survive, but that you can live a kind of active, fit, healthy lifestyle with your transplant. So people spoke about how they would go to the games and actually that was so reassuring for them and kind of gave them that kind of hope for the future for them as well. But what I was more surprised to find actually wasn't that people were necessarily going to receive that hope, but people liked to be able to give that hope and deliver that hope to others. So uh, for example, Emily up here and quite a few other people I spoke with talked about how uh, when they were at the start of their transplant journey, it was really helpful to go to the games, meet other people who you know, were more experienced in their transplant journey. And that was really helpful for them. And now many years down the line, they want to be that helpful resource for someone else. They want to kind of give that hope, give that encouragement to people at the beginning of their transplant journey. So in this sense, it's this idea of kind of giving back by giving forward. So kind of giving back to the wider transplant community who you yourself were supported by um, at the beginning of your transplant journey um, and giving back by, or, you know, or saying thank you by giving forward, paying it forward to new people joining the transplant um, games or who are starting their transplant journey. So in this sense, I kind of talk about how to give hope is to give back. slides um and people also it wasn't just necessarily in relation to the games that people wanted to kind of help people who were new to the games but it was this idea of you know I was really scared when I was on the waiting list or it was horrible when I was on dialysis but I want to give people who are now in that position this hope this encouragement that yes it's not great right now but this could be you in the future. And I had a lot of people talk, especially kidney recipients, talking about kind of giving hope to people who were on dialysis and kind of wanting to be that kind of living proof in transplantation for those people. So in this sense, I talk about the games as a landscape of hope, where you can not only receive hope from those around you, but you can give hope in return. So it's this kind of back and forward um, relationship that you get um, at the games. And finally, I talk about the games as a landscape of motivation. So unsurprisingly, many people use the games as a goal to work towards in their fitness journey. 
I want to win a medal in this sport. So that kind of motivates them to train and to kind of be physically active. And so a few people spoke to me about that, how it kind of helped them in their fitness journey. Um, Here you can see Luke, he talks about how he really didn't feel comfortable after he had his transplant and he wanted to lose some weight and how he used the games actually as that motivation. Luke was very determined to win a gold medal and he kind of used that as that encouragement and his in his kind of daily life yes i'm going to get up and i'm going to train um others spoke about um using the games as a way of regaining the fitness that they had pre transplant and um, so for example i spoke to a young guy who said that after his transplant the first time he looked in the mirror he didn't recognize himself um because he just looked so unwell he'd lost so much weight and how actually for him, the games was about trying to reclaim his kind of sporty identity, kind of go back to the kind of sense of self that he had before he had his transplant and regain that identity that he felt he had lost. Um, But it wasn't just in relation to kind of physical activity and fitness that people talked about motivation, but actually a lot of people spoke about this kind of mental encouragement uh, that the games gave them with this kind of goal to work towards. So it kind of gave me something to get up in the morning for, to look forward to if I was down and I was struggling. And um, I had a few people say to me um, that they wanted to be Olympic athletes. That was like their goal in life, their dream. And when they became unwell, when they had their transplant, that was something they realized they wouldn't be able to achieve anymore and how upsetting that was for them. But actually, the games is a way that they could reorientate their thinking. OK, I can't reach that goal, but I could reach this new goal now instead. And it was a way of kind of ensuring that they still felt motivated to engage in sport because they had something else to work towards. So rather than, for example, focusing on what has been taken away or what they can't do anymore, people can focus on what they can do, what they can now achieve, these new goals, these new kind of um, aims that they can work towards. So in summary, I kind of talk about this landscape of motivation where people can focus on new goals, they can shift their mindset to this kind of can do attitude um, and in doing so not only improve their physical health, but also their psychological well-being. So in taking those three points together, the landscape of belonging, landscape of hope and landscape of motivation, I argue that the games are a therapeutic landscape of social relations. So it's these relationships that happen at the games in that particular space and time that lead to the games being therapeutic or health promoting in some way for the people that take part. So one of the arguments that I make in my paper is that the games can be understood as what I call a peer-to-peer -peer clinic. So I define this as a space that improves health and well-being and where individuals are more actively involved in their care on a reciprocal level with their peers than in the traditional hospital clinic. So it's really this idea that you can be involved in improving your own health and well-being and that of your peers. So rather than health and well-being being something that we gain simply from the hospital. So, for example, people like Foucault have talked about the hospital clinic and how when you have a problem, that's where you go. And the whole point of the hospital is to fix something that's abnormal or a problem to kind of regulate that body um, and kind of this idea of medical professionals kind of fixing a problem, which I'm not criticizing at all. Obviously, we need that. But this idea of the peer to peer clinic, it's a, I kind of think of it as a space that you're also working on improving health and well-being. But on a peer to peer level, this kind of reciprocal give and take where you're more actively involved. Individuals have agency rather than simply um, this kind of top down approach um, that might be seen in the hospital clinic. I talk a little bit about that um, in, in more depth in in the paper um, and I, I won't get into it too much here. Um, so why does all of this matter? Well, if we can understand the games as a therapeutic landscape or a peer-to-peer -peer clinic, if we can understand that the games provides a, cu a crucial mental health resource for individuals, we may be able to encourage more transplant units and healthcare teams to promote the games to their patients. 
Only two of the people that I spoke with at the games had heard about the games from their hospital. In fact, a few of them, especially from um, different countries in Europe, talked about how their hospital had never even heard of the games and they were the ones kind of telling them this is what it's all about. Um, and there's been quite a bit of research as well um, that kind of emphasizes that, you know, the hospital hospitals aren't super great at promoting the games and that's not necessarily how people find out about them it could be through other transplant groups that they're part of or seeing something online for example but if we can understand the games as this therapeutic landscape or if we can understand that it's not just a, a competitive environment it's not just a one-off event where people do some sport it's actually this kind of really important uh, physical and mental health resource then we can hopefully encourage more people to attend and more transplant units to promote the games um obviously it's not going to replace something like counseling if someone needs counseling but also peer support is very valuable in and of itself for different reasons. Um, at least within the context of the UK, we have limited resources. And this is something that, you know, could potentially ease that pressure in some way. So thank you very much for listening to my presentation. Um, I hope that you agree with me that the um, games can be understood as a therapeutic landscape. Um, Here's a kind of shameless plug for my paper. Um, and yeah, if you read it and kind of have any questions or anything, uh, my email's down there. So yeah, thank you very much. Good. Thank you very much, Abby, for your presentation. So um, uh, right now I will um, open up the floor for questions. So please raise your hand and I will try to uh, keep track of the order or if you want to ask a question you can also uh, do that in the chat below so uh let you me, want just... me to stop sharing my screen or do you want me to uh i think you can stop share right now and and then you can go back to the to the screen if if, uh, if anyone wants so uh, garrett you are the first one thanks Andrew. and thanks abby really really excellent presentation. Love the paper, love reading it, and good to put a face to a name as well. Um, this is exactly the sort of stuff I, I love to read and I think we need. Um, I guess the question I have, and it might be for you, but it might be for others to reflect on as well, um, is I was, I'm always thinking about whether, um, like, how sport is like an active ingredient in this, in this therapeutic process that, that you're describing. Uh, whether it is or whether it isn't, because I guess there's pros and cons to it. Um, in, in one sense, I think it's something like 1% of the UK transplant recipient population um, at, have attended the Games. Mm -hmm. um, so in a way, that's quite a, a small number. So so people who are promoting the Games might want to expand that. So maybe you can get 5%, maybe we can get 10% of people going to the Games. Um, but there's also the underlying issue that, well, lots of people don't like sport and don't, don't feel confident in sport. And, and it could, if for those people, it might actually be not a particularly therapeutic experience. So I wonder whether um, those other people are getting, you know, hope, belonging, um, you know, get, get, getting support, getting everything that they need, all those relational things elsewhere from a, a festival, from clinics, from other other peer to peer things. So I guess, yeah, that's the question. Did, from, from your sense, not coming from sport, is it is it the fact it's a, is it is it a sporting event that does this? And if so, we need to get more people coming to the games, or are there other things that you've tapped into where you can maybe that you can translate this message to say that okay, you can do other. You don't have to come to the games, but you can learn something from the games in terms of how how helpful it is to go and do other things. It doesn't have to be sport, but but make sure it's. It's all the things you've you've picked out on. What do you think? Yeah, um, I think there's definitely it's like a kind of yes and no to everything that you've kind of said there. Um, in terms of the games themselves, I do think there is something potentially unique in the sense that everyone's competing as part of a team. So whether you go and you don't know anyone at all, you have a team there. You have that support system kind of already there in the sense that oh, I'm part of Team GB or I'm part of Addenbrooke's Hospital or something like that. So you kind of have that 
built-in community before you've even attended the games so it's not like if you're really shy and you don't want to speak to anyone you'll just not make any friends there because you you wearing the kit you're part of that team already um so I do think that the kind of team element of the games plays an important role in you know making that landscape therapeutic but I do think that this can kind of be extrapolated to a lot of other spaces as well um I just don't know if they're happening um in my kind of wider research that I have been doing only a handful of those participants of so I spoke to 44 and I think probably about four of them have attended the games and the rest talk about um, you know, maybe patient support groups, that kind of thing. Like here in Cambridge, we have like the Addenbrooke's Kidney Patients Association. But there's not necessarily something that is always getting people together because you could have had your transplant in a particular hospital, but live miles away. So it's difficult to kind of always get people together and having these events happening. At least that's the sense that I get from Cambridge and speaking to people here. Whereas even though the games are only once a year, I do get the sense that it's something that people really make an effort to go to and look forward to. So I do think there's something unique in the games. Um, and in terms of it being, you know, it might not be a therapeutic landscape for everyone. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely um, could could be the case. And there wasn't anyone I spoke to who didn't seem to enjoy their time there, um, which is probably an obvious thing to say, because if you're not having fun, you'll just leave. Um, but, you know, a lot of the people that I did speak to, they weren't athletes. They weren't going to run or to swim, to cycle. They were going to take part in the darts or to do the bowling. And um, so I do think it's important to have more of these kind of social events rather than just ones focused on sport and competition and winning, that kind of thing. Um, you know, particularly people who are a bit older. And also I think people who are joining for the first time might feel a bit uneasy with maybe taking part in the more athletic kind of events whereas things like bowling anyone can do that and also you're again you're in a team setting already and um, you're playing with people um so yeah I think there's something about the sport but I do think that if you you know you could set up coffee mornings or something like that that also has the potential to kind of have these therapeutic elements in it as well I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Any other questions or comments or reflections? Except for uh, several messages in the chat, but you can read them afterwards if you want. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, I can. I can have. Uh, or I have a, a few questions. So let, let's let's start with one. Uh, I mean, this is very very interesting, and as a. Um, kidney recipient I can you know see myself in in a few of those uh, quotes or I can uh, yeah I'm a little bit familiar to those so I'm a little bit interested in more from a sports uh, sport perspective and this individual sport sports versus team sport perspective so uh, do you have any uh, ideas about similarities differences between in people who are participating in individual sports versus in I mean, soccer, for example, which is a team sport or basketball or, or, mm -hmm. or so, because I guess that this kind of belongingness and yeah, those dimensions could potentially vary between, yeah, between the different uh, parts, because it's a little bit different layers here in, in during the games. I mean, you have the games in general, uh, you have your team, your national team or your regional team. And then within the team, you also might have different types of sports. And then you have the team yeah. sports versus individual sports. So any reflections on that? Yeah, I did have a few people that I spoke with specifically say I only take part in the team sports because that's why I come. Like I come to meet people. I come to see people year on year. I don't have an interest in winning a gold medal in the 100 meters. So I come and I do the bowling and I go to the social events and I take part in the volleyball and that kind of thing because they want to be in that team environment all the time. And then the people that seemed to be a bit more competitive. I mean, at most people, it was I go to meet people and then it was competitive. But there were some people where that competitive bit played a much bigger role than others. And they seemed to be the ones who potentially wanted to do the individual 
races a bit and they would maybe say things like to me you know and it, I wasn't the only person in my category you know that wasn't why I got the medal and things you know like they they like that idea of kind of pushing themselves and and winning really um so I do think that some people only come for the team elements and also things like at the British Games we have the donor run as well and I think um one of the participants only came to do the donor run um, that was a specific reason that he came up, up for the games. Um, so, so yeah, I think that there is an interesting element in team versus individual sports. Um, you know, likewise, I spoke with someone who had um, a physical disability and he kind of said to me, I'm not going to win a running race, but I can take part in the basketball. And this idea that you have events where people of all levels and all abilities can take part, I think is a really important element of the games. Um, it it stops it being a sport and competition solely focused environment and makes it this kind of space for people where they can kind of come and engage with others um, and make that friendships uh, that they wouldn't have had other, otherwise. Mm, good. Thank you very much. I, I I can agree to that. So uh, yeah, that's that's interesting. I was also thinking about. Uh, I will I will read a few comments uh, very soon. But uh, another question related to this. So I'm a little bit interested in if if you have any reflections upon individuals who have been to several games or individuals who, who have been to the first games ever. Because mm -hmm. we can see at least at the World Games, we can see a dropout rate of about or a turnover rate of about 50%. So we are a little bit interested in why why do all these people, you know, join the games over time versus why do they, mm -hmm. uh, you know, join the games once or twice and, and so on. So any reflections on that? Yeah, that's super interesting. To be honest, I haven't thought too much about that really. Um, it tended to be, um, if, if someone had joined for the first time when I asked them why did you come it tended to be specifically to meet other people who have had a transplant um you know rather than the sporting bit you know if you've just newly had a transplant and you probably don't know anyone else who's had one this event's happening it's like great I can come along to that and the people who had attended for many years on the kind of flip side of that their answer was this is the only time I see my like this group of my friends like once a year every year um but yeah I'm not sure I can really answer your question too much other than that very basic point um yeah I've not I've not thought about it too much and it wasn't something that I really asked my participants like why why now like say they'd had their transplant for 10 years why would you come now um yeah maybe I should have yeah, perhaps that's that's a new project or a new yeah, new, yeah. new new paper idea. <laughs> Once the PhD is done. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, uh, I see there is a little bit of conversation uh, from Elaine and Garrett. Uh, does anyone of you want to pick up that uh, that idea, G Garrett or Elaine? Hi, hi. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can. Okay. Good. Welcome. Just, just a little bit difficult for me to do this contribution because I'm at another conference just now and I'm stealing a little time to do this. So sorry if you can hear a lot of noise in the background. No uh, it's just I just wanted to indicate that some recent research suggests that the messages going forward to those who are receiving transplants is underestimating their ability to take part in physical activity and warnings against doing so. It's not a global narrative, but we're definitely picking up indications that guidelines, advice is to be rather overcautious in general. And therefore that puts more of a barrier in place for generally moving, but also doesn't necessarily promote the attendance at the games. Now that's not a blanket criticism. It's just some research indicating that we we might need to change the message and have a more nuanced message you know and uh, and and yeah so that that's it done <laughs> hope you heard that okay 
Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting because a few people um at the European games when I spoke to them um would like they were like like one of the only or the only person from their country that was coming because they said they were advised like the advice that they receive in their country is like you should be really cautious with sport and not engage um which was really interesting um for me because I'd not really thought about how it might differ by country and like the guidelines that are given um yeah and it might be something that that's why you know not just emphasizing the physical side of sport but also the mental health benefits that people can get will be really important as well because it's not just about you know being in amazing shape it's sport can do so much more for people than that um yeah Good. F thank you very much, uh, Elaine, for your, your comments and reflections and Abby's reply. So, uh, Lynn Holt has raised your hand. Welcome, Lynn, and, and the floor is yours. Hello. Nice to see you. Um, just to follow on, I think um, in the UK, we still have problems with um, educating the health professionals. And so that is why there's mixed messaging from all the different transplant units um, around our country. We have, uh, I don't know how many we've got, over, over 60 anyway, teams uh, attend our national games. And um, so uh, the dilemma really is how we, in our charities, wherever we come from, whichever country, how do we get the message through to the health professionals to, then enable them to communicate with the patients. One of the main problems is health professionals, although they may have heard about the games, they don't see it as part of their, their workload, their tick list to inform their patients. So we in the UK have to rely on the team managers. And as I say, we have over 60 of them, but they're not health professionals, a lot of them, they're patients or relatives who take on that role. And um, so again, um, in this country, marketing materials, some of the hospitals, you know, there's guidelines as to what you can put up on the walls in clinic, et cetera. And so it doesn't, it's not made easy trying to give out leaflets or um, magazines, et cetera. So I don't think it's a country problem. I think it's lack of, um, <laughs> lack of uh, maybe appreciation the health professionals um, need more educating to share the message uh, because it is fairly well documented now about the benefits of sport in transplantation and and as you said Abby very uh, the mental health side is so important and there's such a close connection between mental health and physical health that um, it's a no-brainer to mm -hmm get the message out to the patients. Um, but it, it's not happening um, in a standard fashion around our country. Um, somehow we still manage to take, we have lots of, you know, 1% Gareth, I think you said, of our transplant population actually come to our national games. Um, but somehow, even though we, we, we still have a good size games larger than most countries national games, um, if you don't count America, theirs is enormous. But um, we don't have the magic solution because we don't, as a charity, have, um, I guess, the resource to try and get into all the transplant units and, and talk. So we rely on volunteers who, and some of the transplant units, have a great system in place going in and talking to patients and clinic etc and others don't um can't manage it and we're talking volunteers here so uh it's again it's a difficult one to manage yeah definitely i don't have an answer for how we could get it, it was a question you know. yeah no no but one... on delay and yeah mm -hmm. yeah no but i was just gonna say from like the perspective of Adam Brooks in Cambridge and and I'm kind of co-supervised by um a consultant transplant surgeon there um one thing you know I've kind of mentioned to him and again this doesn't solve the like regional problem is things like why isn't there a leaflet 
that people are given on the games when they get given the information when they go home from the hospital or something they then the staff don't they don't even have to say anything they just have to pick the leaflet up and like put it in the patient's hand something like that um but yeah that, that doesn't solve so many of the issues that you just spoke about and so what was his reply he was like yeah make one and I was like okay <laughs> so um I think that's um very encouraging that a clinician is mm -hmm. encouraging that to happen um but I think uh, again some of the centers it's more difficult leaving leaflets lying around it's certainly post-covid yeah uh, of course yeah yeah leaving a load of stuff lying around but um yes it's marketing mm -hmm. um and if he will at least mention it to his patients some transplant units certainly mine in newcastle we used to have it in the information that they were given but most times when they're first discharged they can't think about all these things it's catching them when they're coming back um to start talking about the games uh. They do get the information in the information book, um, which they read before transplant. So it's something to aim for. Mm -hmm. And that's great. And we have people very excited, very ill, but thinking, oh, my God, will I be able to swim again? That's amazing. So it, it so we do put it in pre-op as well as post-op information. But it's revisiting it once they've settled after maybe three months because mm -hmm. they, they're worrying about their drugs and catching infections and everything else. Uh, as yeah. you know or whether they're going to go to the transplant games so mm -hmm. it's education isn't it on all levels yeah definitely solve that one and you we won't be able to manage our national games because there'll be far too many people so mm. anyway but we are taking a big team to the winter games i mean who would think uk is um a winter sports country um so i'm hoping mr sweden that uh, you will have a team in uh, Italy, in Bormio, et cetera. I'm not sure who else is on the call. But the countries that have snow, one would assume they'd have, um, you know, a good number on their teams. But um, we will see. We look forward to it. If anyone's on the call and going to Bormio in March, um, we'll have fun. We don't plan on winning loads of medals, but they love being in the mountains, and that's being together and all the things you've talked about that's yeah that's, well it's not about the medals always so yeah I wish yeah. I could come <laughs> well you could do volunteer but it's it's always expensive going skiing <laughs> anyway, thank, you. <laughs> thank you very much Lynn also for uh, advertising the Bormio games and the, the other types of games we have in the in the federation so uh, next one in the line is Garrett so welcome again I'll, I'll go after uh, Gerardo because I've already asked the question. Yeah. Okay, so uh, Gerardo, it's your turn. Nice to see you and welcome. Hi, hello. How are you, all of you? Uh, nice to, to chat with you. Uh, thank you, Anders, for getting all of this series set up and thank you to Abby. Uh, some of you know me that I'm part of the of the board of the, of the Federation. Um, Continuing in the in the chat about the doctors and how it is related and how the information is passed on, we attended um, ESOT a couple of months ago in Athens. It was really interesting seeing uh, and being having the opportunity and chatting. I was in the in the WTEF uh, stand, and I had the chance to chat with a lot of, of physicians, a lot of doctors, researchers different people and then attending to some of the meetings and well one of the things that it was commonly uh, mentioned it is that not only for recipients but also for patients in general um, physical activity most of the times is recommended by active doctors so there's there's there uh, there's um, a wall there's um, um, a thing that that we will always uh, encounter that if the physician it is not really a believer for him or herself or themselves on the benefits of uh, physical activity, it is really difficult for them to then encourage their patients to do this. You know? So 
Um, also, another of the factors, uh, there were plenty of Spanish doctors. I was uh, recipient in Spain, even I was born in Mexico. And we were chatting about the fact that, for example, Spain, no, that it is the best country in transplantation, the best donation rates, some of the older teams, uh, the numbers every year. It is now, I think, 26 years being the world leader on donation and transplantation in general. But it was really interesting hearing also the doctors that they shared the opinion from the recipients, from the patients that um, there's, there's a disconnection between the amazing work that they do before the transplant and the post-transplant care. In post-transplant care, there's not so much aside of your blood tests, your different studies, no? well, depending on which kind of transplant we have, everything is okay. The labs, the numbers, the results, they show that you are in a, in a good uh, physician. That's it. And that's one of the things that then we were trying to push when we were on the, on the stand, you know, getting the physicians to know these kind of projects and how Avi presented. Also, it is, if you have um, an ex-athlete that wants to go back, this is an objective for them. If you have a sedentary patient, this can be a motivation to get out of the couch and, and walk. You know? And making them also understand that it should be adapted and that the games adapt to the different levels. You know? And I, I always love to mention that most of the times, especially in athletics or in swimming, that you have bigger crowds, the last person that arrives receives a bigger uh, cheer than the first one. Because we know and we understand what means for that person. And it was not always it is an elder person, you know, because we have different levels and we have people that sign up. Um, also one of the improvements that, that, that we need it is that it is safe for everyone. You know? So also from the organization and it is a little bit more complex. Uh, if we began to look at it in, in different perspectives, but I think it is it is that part you know, that it is that barrier of physical activity being recommended depending on also the other side, on the human side of the doctors that we also sometimes forget that they are persons like ourselves and then going in these different uh, uh, levels. You know? And there are amazing places like in the UK uh, with Paul and different people doing amazing job. There are others that we are trying to, to be there, uh, fighting, for example, with the amazing Spanish uh, association, um, organization. But I think that also the next generation of physicians will allow us to reach more to more, uh, to more patients. You know? And I think that it is, it is part of the global effort with Abby's research or with this kind of webinars and all of the talk that that we try to do in, in our environments. Just wanted to, to point out those small elements and thank you again. Good, any any comments, Abby, or should we let Garrett in again? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't think I have much of a response other than yes, yeah, I agree, yeah. <laughs> Okay, yeah, good. So, uh, Garrett, next yeah, in question. A way, in a way, I think it's a really good good sign of um, interesting research, Abby, because the discussion has kind of moved away from you a little bit. But I just, while there's lots of people in the room, we've got a diverse network. I wonder if anyone can have any advice for like, the impact of Abby's ideas. She's obviously come up with some really good ideas here. And we, we're talking about the um, clinician maybe identifying someone needs physical activity and saying, okay, well, the, the games could be could be good for you. But I think Abby's ideas are, well, maybe they need some hope, so maybe the games could be good for you. Maybe they need some belonging, so maybe the games could be good for you. Maybe they need some motivation, so the games could be good for you. So rather than thinking of sport and physical activity as that kind of first thing, I wonder if sort of sh shifting the emphasis on what the games really is could be useful. And I just wonder whether there's anyone who's got sort of clinical experience or sort of patient facing experience to see whether that could work or or does the does the imagery of sport and medals and 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 all that kind of stuff it, it, is that always going to be the first 
thing that people think of with the game. You know, this is an exercise prescription rather than a hope, belonging or motivation prescription. Anyone has any other ideas? Or Abby, of course, but I'm just wondering if uh, anyone else might have some ideas. Um, I'm just going <clears> to, <throat> hopefully I've got a quiet moment. <laughs> um, some of my, a stream of my work is actually working one-to-one -one with clients who come to me for many needs in a counselling um, uh, scenario. And there are, yes, that, that, that we have the ability in that kind of scenario to speak about what matters, your core values, what's meaningful. Um, you know, and that's beyond that sense, things to do with sport or things to do with physical activity. So in that setting, I have found myself being able to be more, um, having a longer conversation that actually would get around to um, purpose, return to life, you know. So that that's, that's certainly possible. And I think actually the, the idea of having more peer-to-peer -peer, um, and mentoring, and more joined up um, support groups and those that already exist. We could change the narrative within those places, Abby, as you pointed out, there, there are pockets of practice in the UK where there are good support groups. And if we just, if we change the narrative, um, there's, there's many examples in physical activity promotion where hard to reach populations who are traditionally not given to following messages about physical activity can be um, persuaded into it if it's on the back of something else. So there's a lot of research looking at football fans and training, it's called. It's been going for a long time. And it was hard to reach men uh, who had, you know, risk factors for heart disease and so on, who were in their 30, 50, 35 to 50 age bracket. Um, and what they did was they came to watch their favourite footballer play. And just by being there, they ended up dribbling the ball. <laughs> so they came for another reason, um, rather than the message of get active, get moving. And I think my feeling too, as a sports and exercise psychologist, is that for, for many people, it's actually quite a difficult um, change of behaviour when you might actually not relate anymore to your body. You might have, you know, let lost the capacity to uh, be aware of how to move. Um, if you're deconditioned due to being sedentary, it's actually quite a challenge to change. So sometimes the conversation is just about how to function in life, how to bend, stretch, reach. Anyway, that's that's enough rant. I could go on forever. I'm not going to stop. <laughs> <laughs> Did that make sense to anyone? <laughs> Yeah, no, def definitely, definitely. Yeah, Abby, Abby, do you want to reply to that? Otherwise, I think I need to wrap up. Uh, un unmute yourself, please. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I'll just reply quickly before um, I think Lynn's got her hand up as well. And I, as you were talking, I was like, I'm gonna forget all of the points I want to make here. Um, but yeah, I think maybe that you know one of the reasons why. I thought about using or coming up with this term like peer-to-peer -peer clinic is maybe because clinic is a word that people like, you know, doctors, medical professionals will understand. Peer-to-peer -peer also makes sense. Kind of putting them together, it it's nothing to do with sport and it could be used in terms of, you know, any other environment as well. So if you kind of say to them, the transplant games, they are a peer-to-peer -peer clinic. Okay, maybe straight off the top of your head that doesn't initially make sense but hopefully pretty quickly it starts to make sense as to what that can be even something like a therapeutic landscape that's not a sport focused term so maybe in terms of kind of using a way of describing the games that just doesn't focus on the sporting element at all 
and um, could be really useful for getting kind of clinicians to understand that the games it's yes they're about sport but that's not what they're about you know um and actually a few of the people that I've spoken with when they went to their first games they didn't take part in anything they just went to observe and then they went subsequently and took part in things because they just wanted to go and see kind of what it was like and kind of you know, they went to meet people and then they met people and then they thought, oh, you know, I'll just give it a go. So you, we don't even have to advertise the games as something that you participate in, but it could be something that you go along and observe. You know, the games move around um, all the time. So that could be a great way for, you know, for example, they were in Leeds when I went. So Leeds Hospital can say, you don't have to go, but why don't you just go along and watch one of the events? Something like that. And I also think that maybe that's where it needs to be a bit clearer potentially on how people can just go along without signing up to participate. Because I remember when I wanted to go, I wasn't sure, like, do I have to register to 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 go along and look at it? Or can, do I just show up? Like, you know, and if there was maybe something a bit more of an awareness of you can just come along and watch, just why not just come along to one event and see, and then people might get talking and then they might go, actually, you know what, maybe I, I could take part. Um, so I think maybe the, the a way forward is really to kind of not focus on sport in order for eventually the sport to kind of come through. I don't know if I've just rambled loads, but um, hopefully that makes sense. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much, Abby. And uh, the time has passed one hour. So I'm a little bit obliged to uh, to say thank you very much for all of you. I know that Lynn has raised her hand. So uh, I suggest that Abby and those of you who want and Lynn can uh, stay a few more minutes. But uh, I want to thank all of you for your comments and in particular you, Abby, for your wonderful presentation. And of course, wish you good luck with your future research endeavors and uh, you are of thank course you. welcome back to the to more to have more webinars in the research initiative so uh, thank yeah, you definitely. and have a have a good evening good night uh, good morning wherever you are and uh, good luck everyone thank okay. you very much thank, thank you bye-bye take care